Okay, thanks, uh, John. So I'll be take, talking a little bit about the uh, solid state air LED lighting area. Apologize, the font seems to have uh, made a font energy, <laughs> a font conversion problem. I should have checked it before I ran it on this Mac over here. Uh, in fact, I wonder if it's, do you think it would run better if I ran it off my, I brought a memory stick version. I don't know though, this is Mac, so probably not. <laughs> I did it on PC. Uh, anyways, I'll start out talking a little bit about the energy savings potential of GAN LEDs. It's actually come a long way in, in a, a very short time. I'll show you on the evolution of, of lighting efficiency. Um, this said, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the current status and problems of, of LEDs and particularly what's next uh, in LED lighting, what we believe. There's still a lot of room for scientific improvement. Some people said, hey, we can buy LED lighting today. What's left in research? Well, actually, the LED light bulbs you buy today in the story are actually only about 20 to 23 percent efficient in terms of energy. We'll talk about limits for a while later. Where we think the potential is, we can get that to 90 percent eventually. So while you, it's still 10 times more efficient than a light bulb, remember a light bulb is only 3 percent to 4 percent energy efficient, uh, we still can get that up to 90 percent, which is uh, still a long way to go. So when people talk about 1 percent change in solar cell, we still have ability to go from the 24 percent efficiencies today of white light generation up to 80, 90 percent. So there's still a lot of room there. Okay, good. This one came out pretty good. So uh, uh, when we talk about energy efficiency, uh, at least in California, uh, lighting basically uh, in 2009 made up about 34 percent of the electrical consumption. Now this number has been reducing only because data servers have been increasing uh, energy use. So this number is now a little bit lower, but still. It's a very big number. Nationwide, it's about 22%, and worldwide, it's about 22%. That means 22% of all elect electricity consumed in the world goes into lighting. <clears throat> Given that the efficacy of, of lighting is, is somewhere on the order of about 20 lumens per watt, even when you figure in fluorescent, because there's so much incandescent and halogen lighting still out there in the third world, this is a huge opportunity to uh, save energy. So this is kind of a historical evolution of, of lighting efficiency. In the lighting world, we actually call it luminous efficacy. That is because your eyes doesn't see power. It sees something called lumens. And when you divide that by the input wattage, you get something called the luminous efficacy, which is I plotted here lumens per watt. Now 200 isn't the theoretical limit, by the way. The theoretical limit is closer to about 400 lumens per watt, by the way. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see Thomas Edison's uh, incandescent light bulb, which really uh, revolutionized and, and led to the industrial age in the U.S., basically came out at about 5 lumens per watt and slowly increased, but we've reached our limit there, and it's about 13 to 14 lumens per watt. It hasn't changed much in, in, a, in a decade. Uh, compact fluorescent, uh, which is a darling of environmentalists, while it does well, it's not as good as linear fluorescent, they're also saturating the fluorescent technologies, and they're saturating anywhere from 70 to 100 lumen per watt. <clears throat> now, recently in the, uh, in the market, you can now buy LED lighting. However, it varies all the way from 50 lumens per watt to 90 lumens per watt, depending on whose product you buy. It's a confusion of standards and specs right now. Uh, and then at UCSB, we've even demonstrated you know, workable LED lighting up to 168 lumens per watt. But I think the story is this will go to 300, 340 lumens per watt over the next five to 10 years. At those kind of efficacies, you could see lighting then uh, will be dominated by this, this thing. And I thought I'd show one of the better uh, uh, LED light bulbs. This is from Cree, which is one of our industrial sponsor. And this really increased sales in the US of the so-called 60 watt LED replacement. This one's now available for $9 at Home Depot and actually utilizes some technology we developed in about 2008 here at UCSB to increase its, its efficiency. Uh, however, uh, and I was just talking to another member today of, of our industrial advisory board, sometimes you see LED lighting and it says, do not use in, in enclosed fixtures. This one doesn't say it, but you have to be really careful about the LEDs you're buying because some of them heat up too quickly and they'll drop to 50 lumens per watt, which takes you back down below fluorescent. So there's still a lot of uh, a widespread going on. And you can see the steepness of this curve means we're still in the learning cycle. So I don't want you to think that LED lighting research is by any means over. However, the potential is starting to actually affect uh, energy savings. And this is uh, where we are in 2014. And this is the uh, forecasted uh, uh, energy going into lighting. This is just the lighting portion. And you can see without LEDs uh, is this black line here. 
And now with the advent of LED lighting, uh, the Department of Energy has estimated we're going to basically reduce our consumption by about 46 percent in the next 15 years, that is by 2030. And that net result will uh, basically result in the savings of about 50 power plants can be taken offline. So it's a very big number and it's on the order of cumulative about 250 billion. This is just done for the United States. We didn't even do some of the other countries which use more incandescent than the U.S. Uh, uses. So some things that, that are, uh, I think that when you, you do lighting calculations, you have to also consider not just the light source, which is what LED manufacturers and CFL touts, but also the task of the lighting. For instance, in the downlight, uh, you may think that the CFL would have been you know, five times more efficient than your incandescent. But actually, what's called delivered efficacy or efficiency, that is what makes it on the table, or let's say you're using this in a kitchen in a downlight fixture, because compact fluorescent has a lot of tubes which can reabsorb the light, it's really only about three times more efficient than an incandescent light bulb. Uh, whereas an LED, since it's already directional, even today, where I'd say it's kind of the, you can get the higher end 100 lumen per watt stuff, you're getting about six to seven times more lighting. So if you have downlight fixtures, it's starting to make sense now. It, depending on how often you keep your lights on, if you're a retail store, the payback period for this $8 light bulb can be anywhere from uh, nine months uh, for, a, a re for a commercial setting. But residential, if you only leave it on six hours a day, it might be three years before it pays itself. This is, by the way, without any rebates at all. So uh, the LEDs haven't had the advantage of any major rebate programs yet. <clears throat> so you've already started to see the LED and lighting. Uh, you probably don't know that a lot of the car headlights, or maybe you do know, a lot of the car headlights are shifting to LED lighting. Everybody has a bunch of LEDs in their pocket right now or their purse if you have an iPhone, because uh, basically if you have any smartphone, it uses LED as the backlighting. And uh, that's kind of what gave us the color uh, cell phones many, many years ago. So where I think the future of this is going? Well, one of the, the things we're... we're as we push the efficiency and as we improve the material science, that is the defect density, we're able to get new materials on true uh, gallium nitride crystals. And gallium nitride is the base material used in all these uh, white lighting products. Um, and we're able to replace the sapphire substrate or silicon substrate, which it was initially used on, put it on a more pure uh, substrate, and we're able to replace 10 LEDs with one LED. Uh, and I brought an LED light bulb that utilized this, but I actually lost it because I was running over here so quick to give the speech. It actually popped out of my pocket. It's such a small light bulb. No joke. So somewhere around campus, there's an there's a MR16 with a single chip of gallium nitride, <laughs> which is unfortunate because it's a $20 light bulb. It's twice the cost of this one, but it's, it's very small and it's very bright. So you'll have to take my word for it. Uh, anyways, that only uses one-tenth the area, and that's very exciting. Uh, Believe it or not, that came out of some very complex physics. So in addition to kind of applications, we do very complicated uh, material science here in which we look at the, uh, the, the LED, the heart of the LED light bulb is a single crystal, just like the silicon integrated circuit is a single crystal. Our, our material that we use is a single crystal of a compound semiconductor called gallium nitride. UCSB is known to be the world's expert in compound semiconductors because Herb Cromer, when he came here over 25 years ago, told the dean we should focus on not silicon, could get up that in Silicon Valley, but we should focus on a revolutionary new material of gallium arsenide. And that is kind of what led to the telecom revolution. That subsequently attracted stars like Suji Nakamura and myself to come here to work on another compound semiconductor, which now has widespread use in lighting. So instead of a cubic structure like, like silicon, it's an actual hexagonal structure. When you grow this stuff, it comes out looking just like this. And we've determined what the optimum way to cut these crystals are. And that's going to help us solve the two remaining problems with LEDs, because the two biggest problems with LED are basically heat, which is the fact that if you put this LED in an enclosed fixture while you bought it at that nice 100 lumens per watt, by the time the fixture heats up to 100 degrees C, it's dropped by 30 40%. So then it's dropped down to about CFL level performance. The other uh, a problem that we've uh, gone a long way to sh solving is why can't you just take one LED and keep turning up the current? And that's because the efficiency peaks at low currents and it drops quickly as you raise the current. Uh, this one uh, we've started to solve and I'll just show you the new data on that. This is a, one of those new crystals I showed you where we cut it at, a, at an angle. Uh, so it's literally like cutting diamond at a different angle and doing all your technology there. 
And you can see that the black curve is the new curve uh, from two years ago. We're able now to get efficiencies of about 50% at very high current densities. And this is the seaplane stuff is what's currently in the market. You can see you can't even take the LED past 80 amp per square centimeter. And it's dropped from 60% to below 30. If I drew it out here, it actually is down here. So it's, it's a heater out here. So uh, this has not been commercialized yet. This is uh, what we're in the process with, with several of our partners trying to figure out how to reduce the cost of these different crystal planes. Turns out it costs more because the scale of manufacturing hasn't been scaled up as much as the so-called standard seaplane technology. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, some other kind of interesting future trends I'd like to talk about uh, in the last five minutes are what I call putting intelligence into the lighting. Uh, Apple, given that their Apple's already figured out how to do that, uh, they've actually made uh, some Bluetooth configurable light bulbs that you can actually change the color temperature with your cell phone. However, that's kind of a gimmicky. I think what we're going to see is even higher speeds and, and actually transmission of data over LEDs. And then the, the last area will be uh, laser lighting. So first, let's talk about intelligent LED lighting. So if you think about it, we've replaced the kind of stupid incandescent filament now with a very smart uh, semiconductor chip. Right now, it's only emitting light. But we can put a lot more function onto that if we put, for instance, uh, a signal on the light. So your eye won't see the signal variation because we're going to modulate it so fast. Uh, and this technology is being called Li-Fi or light fidelity. Uh, currently, it's at about a megabit per second, so that's a little too slow. Uh, we're uh, working on some new technologies and filing patents that will enable us to go very high speed, that is into the 5 to 10 gigabit range of communication. And you could imagine that you could have an office where all these light bulbs are tethered and communicating with all your devices. This might, for instance, only be used by the uh, NSA, for instance, because uh, you could do this and have completely uh, secure communication within a room and not, you know, have somebody tap into your wireless signal from outside. Or uh, you could have it be an open network and just uh, use it for its faster ability to transfer data faster. The other thing is LiFi has been shown to have a, a, a global positioning accuracy of a few millimeters. And this is much better than radio frequency, which is a few meters. So there's all sorts of, uh, this is a wide open field um, where there's only a, a very few companies even making products in this field. So I think we'll start to see uh, not just the uh, more efficient light use of light, but e even the more intelligent use of light. So uh, that's something that uh, we're starting to work on too. The last area uh, that I think is real exciting and John alluded to is we're well known to be experts in laser. Uh, so if somebody asked me what's beyond LED lighting, the natural evolution would be to laser-based lighting. That is. The same material that's used to do an LED is used to make a laser. And the advantage uh, is that you can make it much, much brighter than LED lighting. And this just shows you a demo. And in fact, it, it's just a disk of phosphor being hit with a laser here. And this is already giving efficiencies that are almost comparable to fluorescent lighting. Will eventually be equal to LED lighting if we can get to the higher wall plugs. Uh, so we envision laser-based lighting. Uh, impacting some fields. In fact, it already is being used for the uh, projector uh, for Casio. This projector above you right now is a very big Hitachi projector. The reason it's so big is because it has a huge metal halide bulb in here. Casio has a, a laser-based light, light bulb in there that is about one-fifth to one-fourth that size. So I think that one is already on the market, and that's a laser light bulb. Uh, the other surprising one is going to be uh, even going after regular LEDs. Uh, so this is the, um, the, the so-called efficiency as a function of current density for a laser light bulb. And it actually has the opposite physics of LEDs, whereas LEDs are shown in blue and red here, drop efficiency with currents. Lasers show the opposite effect. Once you hit lasing, the efficiency rapidly rises to the point it's actually around 50% now at very high current densities. So this, uh, to give you some scale here, this is about 50 times more light coming from a single chip than what you get from an, LED, an LED. Uh, so believe it or not, the first place you're going to be able to buy a laser light bulb is in a BMW car next year. BMW has announced they're going to replace the high beam with laser headlights. And before you get uh, too scared, uh, they actually down convert the laser light to phosphor light. That is, they hit uh, a phosphor. So actually no laser light exits the headlight. So what exits the headlight is the red, green, blue from the phosphor. 
Now you may ask, why would BMW want to do something like this? Not only that, make it a little bit uh, more trendy, because it lets you shrink the headlight, and they didn't even show that in its markup here. But what it, what it does do is it increases nighttime visibility of your car from about 100 meters, which is what you have today, to about 700 meters. And it does this without influencing, it doesn't look any brighter to your eyes. Maybe you don't believe that yet, but they, they've already passed the specs in Europe. However, you can imagine they're having some trouble in the U.S. getting this accepted. Uh, so it'll take a little while. It's just, yeah, it's, the reason is it's not a laser light. It's just that the source is smaller. So, you know, the parabolic, you know, your flashlight collimation. So because the, the parabolic mirror can be made much smaller, they're able to collimate the light much better. Because a filament in a car headlight is about this big. But a laser headlight, the filament size is about less than a millimeter. So it's just this optics problem, whereas you have a smaller source. This, by the way, is uh, an LED headlight. So an LED headlight is twice the viewing distance of your headlight. But uh, BMW just decided to skip right by that. So you can imagine this caused quite a stir. Uh, and Audi came out with their announcement that they're going to have laser headlights. So this is kind of going to be a little bit of a car automobile war, I think, over the next few years. But it's, it's great because it'll pull, I think, lasers into some lighting applications. However, it's going to be about a $1,000 to $2,000 feature to add that to your car. So. But you've got to depend. If, if you can see five times as far and you live in a place with a lot of cows or deer, you might want to. Do you, know, do you know if they require active cooling? No, there's no active cooling. Uh, it's, it's a heat sink is good enough. Just like with this one, the heat sink is good enough. It's about 10 watts is the load. This is almost exactly 10 watts. So it's just as long as you have the laser mounted to metal. And actually the phosphor they mount to metal too, to cool it. So. Uh, Yep. Um, they've got anomalous issues, I guess, because of the fact that the phosphor's there. But what if, you know, what if you broke it then? Yeah, they're trying to figure out all the fail safes that if the headlight breaks, the laser has to shut off immediately. Or it's in an accident. So I think that's the issue they're working on. But they've apparently satisfied the European agencies. I think they're going to have to be a little bit tougher in the U.S. That there's just no way the laser light can get out of the, of the light bulb. Casio did it uh, for the projector, too. So the minute, like actually when you stand in front of the projector, it immediately shuts off. Uh, which is uh, leading to the next thing, if you can do projectors, why can't you do TVs? So this is uh, the world's largest uh, uh, projection TV. It's a 100 inch TV. It was shown at CES this year. This also uses a laser, but again, it down converts to red, green, blue phosphor, so laser light doesn't actually come out of the screen. So this is about the size of a DVD player, and um, you may ask, why would this be LCD? It, it actually is cheaper than an LCD screen. This is about $3,000. Uh, as you know, if you go try to buy a, a 70 inch today, it's about $3,000 in LCD. So projection technology may win at the higher sizes, I think. Definitely for uh, rooms like this, it, it would win. Uh, so that's kind of a summary as, as we're working on a, a lot of exciting materials. Primarily in the, in the center, we're working on the laser lighting and the, and the, uh, and the solid state LED lighting. Uh, and basically, using the interdisciplinary match between uh, the material science of gallium nitride and the electrical engineering department. Uh, and there's not a whole other use we didn't even tell you about, uh, which is for power electronics. Uh, but these are kind of the application areas. So in summary, uh, basically, hopefully showing you how we've taken some basic materials breakthroughs in gallium nitride, and they're now translating into um, very exciting uses for higher energy efficiency and lighting. Uh, we made a major breakthrough in getting uh, higher efficiency at higher currents, which we believe will help reduce the cost of lighting. And uh, we even think that getting these lasers will enable further applications like TV and other things. Thank you.